Welcome everyone to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host, and with me for all of these Bad Batch reports is Kyle Gould. It's me, Pedro. I mean, Kyle. You're Pedro now? No, I, I am Kyle. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> this is weird. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you are an actor, so you could have you could have been a Pedro at some point. And Pedro's just here. He's excited to talk about X Men '97. <laughs> oh wait, no, that's not what this is about. Okay, <laughs> you do love X Men '97. Cyclops Redemption. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yep. <laughs> we are here to talk about episode ten and eleven of the Bad Batch season three, Identity Crisis, and Past the Point of No Return. I have so many. Oh, man, I have complaints about titles again. <laughs> What the frick? <laughs> She's just throwing paint at the wall here. Or they hear this podcast and they're like, what'll piss Kyle off the most? Let's call it identity crisis and make it not make it very clear at all as to what's going on. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense to me if we're talking about Emery's archetypical uh, arc. But uh, yeah, no, it's... um. <laughs> I, I never know how you're going to react to a title. Oh, my God. I love Past the Point of No Return for a bunch of reasons that I'm going to Really? Get into. I really love it. Yeah. I don't think they're there yet. I think that's like, like, that's like you came up with the title at the end of the oh. episode and they're like, oh, I guess because the very next episode, that's the point of no return. I mean. And I don't think even then that's the point past the point of no return. And who is past the point of no return? You know what? I don't, we'll get to that episode when we get there. I have a whole theory. Okay. That, Can't wait that, to hear it. Cause yeah. It needs theory. some work. It it only it only makes sense if you are a fan of musical theater. These episodes would have just been better with numbers. <laughs> I'm just going to say. You say that. Um <laughs> All right. Sunset on Pabu would have been a better title for this last episode. A Sunset on Pabu. Yeah, maybe. Uh I have theories though. <laughs> sure. All right. Or, or or something somebody says in an episode <laughs> would be great too. It's like this meta Thing that- I I like it when thing when when the title of the episode is said in the episode. Yes, I am I am a big fan of that. Uh, we are big fans of Taskmaster, and that's always what happens. Absolutely, yes. You're constantly <laughs> wondering Ooh, when does that get said? When and does that get said? And then it happens, right? Yeah. Maybe we should do that if we ever cover another show together. That sure. we were like, and the new title for this episode is actually. <laughs> oh, there's some good ones for this episode. <laughs> there's, so I mean, good episode. I mean, uh, there's a really good one that's near the end with uh, of this of this first episode. Yeah, so you give away more than you think is a great title for this episode. Re- like, yes, you give away more than you think. Yeah, so good. I was gonna get to that later. But hey, it's I perfect. was just thinking about titles. And that's the one you I give think... away more than you think. And that is the one that I was exactly thinking yeah? of. Yes. Oh, we're, we're synced up. It's yes. Yeah. New names for the episodes. <laughs> Based on what people say in them. You know what? Hit me up too and let me know what you think this episode should have been called. Or if you think it should be called Identity Crisis. I think it's so. fine. Like, I, it works for me. So I'm, I don't complain. I'm well, not you know who's not complainer. having an identity crisis? Anyone else in Anyone, this episode. Except for Emery. No, I mean, it's very apparent <laughs> who these episodes tend to circle around. Yeah. And they have been very femme focused, which I appreciate. And so let's dig into it. We have a cute sure. new alien. I don't know if it's actually a new alien species or just a new baby alien. They have four ears. It's like. Did we, you know that? They have four ears. We both said this baby alien, this baby mm-hmm. is so cute. Did you know the baby has a name? No, I didn't. The baby's name is Bairn. B-A-Y-R-N. It's a Bairn. Like it's a, a little Bairn. baby. A little Bairn. Like a little Bairn. Yeah. I I, uh, I like Easling. babies with four Force powers. I didn't write it down, but the mom was actually named two Aisling or Aisling or something. I can't remember. It was there. It's out there already, and it's in the credits. And the same lady uh, played both characters of the baby and uh, the mom, uh, or the caretaker. I think she was the mom. She seemed stressed. <laughs> she definitely did, <laughs> yeah. but I didn't want to presuppose. Right? Oh, fair. It could have been grandma. Yeah, you never know. Exactly. Right? Poor grandma. Um, anyways, we have this cute thing and we, we find out later on in the episode that this is all about the plot to capture M count children, which we kind of suspected after last episode with Ventress and this, Mm -hmm. you know, more explanation of that. It's well, the force sensitive children, Mm -hmm. um, they've certainly been methodical in 
laying the groundwork that Lifetime Star Wars fans know. <laughs> there was a lot of motifs in the music in this season and in these episodes yeah. that have been very similar to other Star Warsian motifs, mm-hmm, John mm-hmm. Williams sort of stuff. But the intro piece, the first 30 seconds of music in this episode was so different, I felt. Yeah, it was. was like, we it were felt both... like an orchestra tuning up. Yeah, we were both uh, caught off guard by that. Um, and I think it had a lot to do with the new characters, new world, new environment. We didn't know who these people mm-hmm, were. Mm-hmm. There was a scene that was going on. It just seemed so interesting and new. And I realized, ah, this is Act 3. Act 3. This is exactly the point where Act 3 is going to begin, right? There's three mm-hmm, acts, each mm-hmm. of them are five episodes long. Go figure, this is the start of that. There's four episodes left at the end of this. So this is the introduction of Act 3, and we get a whole new scene and a whole new set of music, like an orchestra tuning up, and I thought it was really pretty. What did you think of... Uh, I mean, it's it's such a brief thing when he, he goes and captures the baby later, but what did you think of this whole plot to like capture... The Jedi and like Cad Bane being one of the triple A certified (laughs) bounty hunters. Class A bounty hunters. (laughs) Uh, Yes, it was so interesting um, that I wrote something. Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Uh, All right. I'm going to see if I can find this right now. Here you go. There's only one bounty hunter you can call when you're looking to kidnap kids. Did you have an innocent little bundle of joy, preferably pre-speech but post-diapers that you need but sconded, appropriated, purloined, and pilfered? Is your empire's little heir or heiress in your way of ascension? Make a holo call today. Operator Toto 360 is standing by with industry-priced Class A bounty hunter contracts ready. Hire the best in the galaxy and get the best with spurs on. Class A bounty hunters are trademark classification by the Galactic Empire and there will be no cl- no reimbursement for collateral damage. Once the contract is fulfilled, you or your loved ones are not covered by this contract for any harm or classic retribution or revenge. Payment in full is expected upon a fulfillment of the contract. Fees and taxes may very well depend on the level of galactic interest on the planet and the contract is entered on the level of... Who? <laughs> I'll retake that. Fees and taxes may very well depend on the level of the galactic interest of the gla- on the planet the contract is entered into. Offers void on Lethal and Moncala. Oh my gosh. Hire Cad Bane today. <laughs> I I want to do a commercial for this. <laughs> you have to do a better recording of that. Okay, I'll, I'll try. But at the same point, like, yeah, the guy just kidnaps kids. Yeah, no, seriously, is that what he's known for? I honestly... But now it makes me go like, okay, is that why he showed up? Like, <laughs> uh, no, that's not why he showed up on... on uh, Book of Boba Fett, but maybe? I mean... He, he's, he's there just, to get the baby, the child as well? I guess. But, <laughs> I mean, this 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 plot ties into Book of Boba Fett cause we're, and, and the Mandalorian cinematic universe because we're, you know, it, we are faced with a baby in a baby carriage. Absolutely. Very similar to Baby Yoda, i.e. Grogu. Um, but it also parallels to the dark Jedi uh, or dark parallel to the... Uh, you know, what Palpatine did during the Clone Wars. Yep. And also a dark parallel to what the Jedi did. Intentions being different, actions still separating children from their family. And this is something that I've been harping on for a really long time, which is this is this motif of the House of Atreus, which is we're taking children away from their family. We're using them for whatever means we're using them for. And it actually ends up not being a good thing even if it's the jedi even if it's the jedi that's taking them away from their families absolutely um this ends up being an emery centric episode she has had enough she's like give me give me the keys boss i will be your head head scientist head doctor hemlock's like huh all right sure we'll give you a spin but to me it gives me the impression that if she messes up, he has no problems with like getting rid of her. Mm-hmm. This is really important because it's it's not just leaning into her ambition, but it's also she thinks that she's t- taking a step into more power from a, like an active sense, right? I'm going to get more power and I'm going to grow in my power, which is what often women think that they're going to be doing when they girl boss their way into a promotion. But often what they find is that this is actually 
an illusory boon of success and that they're missing something that becomes very apparent to them in in that success that they've won. So mm-hmm. she's got the big title. And what does she find? Well, she finds she can't, she's not really cut out to be the cruel person that is being demanded of her. And actually, she wants to be kind to these children. And it shows that she stepped into the queen archetype. And I'm going to go into that as we get through the episode. But she is that was very interesting about the prison mm. component. There were a couple things. One, she she's taken on the role. She's been informed and given the knowledge mm-hmm. and therefore has the power. But at every turn, she doesn't she have any doesn't control. Have the, she doesn't have that power mm-hmm. because um, Hemlock it chides her when she tries to find out the name of the co- of the kids don't right. get too attached don't get too attached when one of them tries to escape she tells the scorch and i always say in my head skid mark whenever <laughs> i hear him i hate him so much i don't think there's a character this season that i i loathe as much as i like, like one light an episode and you're like i hate that guy I hate him so there's no like got, can't can't even see his face and no, you're like <laughs> never see his face and his glowing face plate just is stupid and i I always figure his expression is the dumbest expression possible because he just seems to like to hurt people Mm -hmm. and just to torture people. And he always hides behind the rule of like, oh, well, it was protocol. Oh, that's the rules. Or that's what I was told to do. Ha ha ha. I get to be bad. I just I don't like him. Um, He still stuns the kid, even though she tells the kid and tells him not to. Yeah. And then here's the kicker for me. And a couple of people I didn't even notice it. There's a whole second level. Mm-hmm. of of viewing a viewing gallery of mm-hmm. the kids down below and so even though she's in there and amongst them and testing them and running those tests which the droids are doing anyway she goes up to the top it, but exactly yeah, right yeah, but yeah, yeah. She do- they don't she spends the time down there on the mm-hmm. detention center floor with the kids and none of those other people do and they're all standing above her judging yeah. and they're bearing witness to the actions that happen below so the heroine's journey phase, this illusionary boon of success, is often what people find when they're given the the power that they think they've wanted this whole time. And they found out that it's not what they wanted. It d- comes with tons of strings attached that you have to con- continue to behave in the manner by which especially the patriarchy expects of you. And again, there's a lot of patriarchal metaphors happening within this in that we have to mutilate the children we have to control the children they can't have emotions they can't have love and you find that being a woman of power or a person of power in that dominator culture into into that position means that you basically have to live by those rules even more Mm -hmm. and so it shows it really really well like you pointed out yeah well and that happens in real life too as soon as you grant power mm -hmm. you know when you're not part of the system and you rebel against it and you start to rub up against the edges of it if you're granted power within the system you suddenly become an element of reinforcement of the power and yep. of the system and society. And so that happens all the time. And I talk about this outside of this and how billionaires surround themselves with millionaires to protect them. Yeah. And millionaires mm-hmm. surround themselves with, with a certain degree of wealth for those people around them. And so they're constantly insulated. And if you rebel and you fight against this, that prospect of wealth is then put in your, in your lap so that you can continue to reinforce the system as well um, for the people that are continuing to, to better and better be embedded by it exactly and so she's introduced the <sighs> children and like you said she tries to like humanize them but is like chided for it but finds that the only way that she can kind of find some sort of balance in this very unfair situation for these children and mm-hmm. for herself in some ways is by humanizing them and giving them things you know that um comfort them mm-hmm. um tarkin uh calls up hemlock let's talk about that (laughs) hey i've been doing some accounting since 
Rampart left me the accounting books. <laughs> well, I mean, let's we can go back to Rampart. I think that's really relevant. <laughs> yeah. Tarkin is the reason for the downfall of Rampart. Yeah. And it was all to do with the misappropriation of funds. Mm-hmm. It is remarkable how much money is relevant and important to Tarkin and to the Empire as a whole as Tarkin tries to justify all of his expenses. Building the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> like, right? he's just trying to like squeeze the pennies out of the budget the intergalactic empire's budget so that he can continue to build build his uh you know technological terror as it, it's, it's it, like it's like administrative 101 you know like business administration and yeah. and like the the trade guild or the the trade union and the and the banking guild would be like yeah we get you dude it just <laughs> If this is the sort of cost that the Death Star has, it really makes me wonder, like, how the heck did the First Order even afford Starkiller Base? Like, if if it caught, like, if 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 Tarkin is already like penny pinching to the point where he's calling out Hemlock, it's who's like- on personal leave from the Emperor with a full discretionary funds, and it's classified to a level that Tarkin can't even question that, how did the First Order? <laughs> I mean, it was 30 years difference. Yeah. Uh, Technology is a lot better. I yeah, understand. yeah, yeah. And it, like, this is only like a year after, two years we're, after. We're talking about car phones in bags in the 80s and 30 years later when the first yeah. iPhones are coming out. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's still at the same point where I was a little. I'm the, the, I think ec- it's funny. <laughs> it's one of those things that were <laughs> economics of scale in a fantastical or story related vein like this kind of knocks things out of yeah like whenever you you demand realism of star wars uh and they give it to you you're like you're playing yourself because a disappointment it's yeah it's just like oh that was realistic but now i'm just sad because my fantasy is broken sort of when it costs 1600 credits just to fill up your star your 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 little star talk about inflation right that's a lot of it's a lot of credits. Yeah, that was next episode. <laughs> I know, but it was still money related. So. Um, but we do see that Hemlock is sent to the uh, clone assassin after X2. So let's go back to Tarkin. Why mm-hmm. is Tarkin involved in this? Why did why did they have this like Tarkin wants you to call him? Hemlock goes and little one man, one glove sits down at his desk and <laughs> calls up. Why? Tarkin. Why Tarkin? Uh, is doing the accounting it, it's weird too especially if Tarkin is in the know of maybe it's just like a challenge right like how dare you be the pet project person to the empire I was the pet project person maybe it's just like political These episodes are 24 posturing. minutes long and they're giving 30 to f- 30 seconds to a minute to Tarkin and Royce Hemlock having a conversation I st- I'm having trouble seeing mm. the rationale behind why that moment needed to exist in a story called Identity Crisis. Hemlock's not having an identity crisis. Tarkin's not having an identity crisis. Why are we diffusing the focus away when we could have kept it on our principal on, characters? On Emery, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's something to do with the meta plot, which we weren't going to dig into too much in this episode because we have lots of thoughts that we're probably saving until we see the whole story. Absolutely. But that is a challenge of this story in the third season, especially that we both have noticed that there is much more influence of the meta yeah, and the overall flow of time of Star Wars and how much they want to build that connective tissue to both later stories and also to justify the rise of Skywalker. Yeah. And and of course, we've got Matt McNivitz out there and he is kind of con- keeping an eye on the plot for the entire season, right? So there could be something with Tarkin later on and it they're bringing him back. Yeah, there has I mean, to be. This is foreshadowing in the very first part of the third act to say Hemlock's downfall will be connected to Tarkin in some capacity in the same way that Royce Rampart mm. was knocked out by Tarkin. Because Tarkin showed up and then Rampart died. I mean, maybe that's how he gets more funding for his budget. His colleagues have unfortunate accidents. Maybe. Yeah, maybe that's how that works. But Project Necromancer isn't going away. So. No, it's not going away, but I'm sure that there's more than enough cloning scientists to take it on. Yeah, Hemlock just happens to be the most perverse. <laughs> yep. Uh, 
but I will give it up to Jimmy Simpson <laughs> again, who just does such a great job of, I mean, Hemlock seems more tired than he did before. It seemed yeah. like he had darker circles under his eyes. He didn't have as much, there's just not a much, much emotion connected to him there. He's not impassioned like he was before. And when Emery Carr wants to become the head of the necromancer project and he finds out tarkin's calling he's like yes yes whatever i i gotta go talk to tarkin for some reason Uh, (laughs) i'll make this decision in the moment just seems worn down yeah it doesn't it also feels like he's stuck maybe because Mm -hmm. he needs omega to make it any sort of breakthrough and it's like well might as well fend off tarkin from getting into my budget (laughs) the most like too real moment of star wars absolutely (laughs) get your hands off of my corporate budget (laughs) yeah and if it's anything like any sort of political bureaucracy that i've ever worked for if you don't spend that budget you lose it (laughs) yeah and so once that scene happened i started questioning the other scenes as they were coming up why is this important what do you why are you showing me this what's Mm -hmm. what i want out of this and so we got that with um the second shadow operative clone Mm -hmm. uh getting sent out on their mission that made perfect sense to segue from tarkin there and then to show us having um emery carr and uh commander skidmark arrive at coruscant with the next scene, I was starting to, yeah. th- I literally was like, why is this important? Why is mm-hmm, it not? Mm-hmm. Wow. Highlight moment, as we said at the top. This is one of my favorite lines, favorite moments between two characters that I don't really have much care for. I'm not a big Cad Bane fan. I'm not a big Western guy. Maybe that's my problem or bounty hunter lover. But mm-hmm. like this moment and what good old Red Eyes sees and how quickly he sees to the true nature of what a person's asking after. Such a great moment. Yeah, we have a friend whose like favorite character in Star Wars is Cad Bane. And I, I don't know, I think they kind of did him dirty in Book of a Fed. <laughs> like, he's not dead. That's he's the not big dead? Rumor, is he's not dead. Well, that's that the great. The light cause... on his vest is still f- is flashing at the end. Oh, okay. I mean, it's Star Wars. I accept no one's death. Right. So. Also, bounty hunters kind of have to have secondary ways of <laughs> making sure they don't die, die in yeah. a situation. No, but this this uh, this actual scene with it, um, you know, her approaching Hemlock, you know, the specimen and Emery going in and, and being kind of shocked by the age of the child right. and it being kind of in a perambulator, a little like, you know, carrier. Uh and then being like, and where did this child come from? And Cad Bane, do you want to do your best Cad Bane? Asking questions like that, you give away more than you think. Yeah, it's perfection because it also shows kind of how she is even transformed within the episode. And that comes Absolutely. down to a lot of the challenge that Nalise gave her in saying like, well, how am I supposed to do this? Because like, they're kids, they're much younger than I expected. Like, I and, and she's just like, you know, you just try to make it easier and you do what you can. Yeah. And um, this is entirely archetypically archetypical of a movement to being a queen or a goddess or a, you know, like a powerful feminine character. And it's all about integrating the need to care for others into yourself. Right. And If you, the gentle listener, did not catch what Cad Bane saw, the next moment they are, they hit you over the head with it when she pulls out Omega's little lunchbox and there is Lula, the secondary (laughs) Tuka doll, in the box. So, and she makes the choice to go and bring comfort to Eva after the whole Jax rebellion. I thought that she gave it to Jax. No, she gave it to Eva. But Jax is the one. Really? Eva's Eva's the girl. Yeah. But Jax was already taken away by the time she got back. And Eva was upset about things that were happening. Well, no, she gave the doll to Eva before because she was sad and wanted to go home. Oh, I'm trying to remember it's the at the order very of end things. of the episode. But she, she gives leaves the, the doll and I was positive. She left the doll and we'll find out when we see them next. Because I maybe that doesn't really make it clear. She gave she gave the doll to Eva, the little girl. Because I th- I have a lot of theories about why that Jax was the one who is the boy, the green boy who yeah, wanted to punished. escape and he was punished and taken away. She arrives back. He's taken away. Yes. Jax is upset. the Mirialan mm-hmm. and uh, Eva is the Iktochi. So this whole like queen stage is about 
becoming comfortable with the fact that you actually have to be a protector of others and you have to care for others in your surroundings Mm -hmm. and try and make the community that you live in as terrible as it is a better thing. And that is how you become kind of the form of wholeness that you can become at this stage. And it doesn't necessarily have to be mothering, but or parental related, but oftentimes from a life archetype perspective, it ends up being you become a parent. Uh, We don't have really a lot of, uh, especially in Western culture, we don't have a lot of other caregivers that are not codified as parental figures, right? Yeah. Like in, if you go into other societies and Japanese societies where your grandparents and whatnot live with you, there is that relationship, right? Those sorts of parental Mm -hmm. roles and uh, But that takes on uh, the crone phase where you're still a mentor, but you're older and you've seen more and you've experienced more and it it even if you're caring for the children it's more from a different aspect this is about building the community again yeah but that's still just from a western culture perspective we it, can't we can't no. ascribe yeah cuz we fair. just don't there just we just don't have a lot of those role types in our culture we don't have a lot of not anymore close connected I think we, tissue we used to yeah you know you know longer ago um but yeah this this really shows a lot of the changes to Emery identity crisis it's not even really a crisis she sort of just accepts that her role has changed and she's deeply uncomfortable with it but thematically this ties to sort of how we're seeing her break out of the house of Atreus curse which is the idea house of Atreus the famous Greek house that was famously known for either consuming their own children (laughs) serving their children to the gods or um killing their children so that they could get the winds to go their way so that they could go and fight with Troy. <laughs> That's the house of Atreus and it's because each generation chose to basically do bad actions that would elongate the curse and cause suffering on the future generation. At one point Orestes decides he's no longer going to be cursed and tries to make amends and accept the fact that his entire family has done all of these awful, awful things all of their lives. And the uh, harpies who have been chasing him, the furies, to try and punish him turn into the humanities, basically kindness, because he has broken the curse himself. And so I think Emery is going to be one of the people who says, I suffered as a child. I was under this curse as a child. I was not treated fairly by Nalase. I was discarded. I was, you know, made who I am by Hemlock. I no longer want to live my life this way. And I no longer want any children to live their lives this way. I think that's what they're setting up with this. Yeah, well, sins of the father sort of scenario and you're and you're you are talking about the Orestia written by Aeschylus yes about Agamemnon and Orestes and yeah um all that whole entire story yes yeah. there's <laughs> which is I mean hard it's a hard read yes um but the the motif itself shows up in our culture when we become too consumptive of our children's future And that's what the Clone Wars represents. It's what the clones represent to this story, especially in the story of the Bad Batch and them trying to break away from consuming the children, which all clones were created to be destroyed. Hmm. That's really cool. You're like, what have you been talking about all this time? Well, that's what I've been talking about all the time. I mean, I know what you've been talking about the entire time. <laughs> but I was just trying to make it clear because you, yes. you talk about the House of Atreus, but I think that that's a reference point. But it's a motif that is mm-hmm. that is referred to in a lot of media, not just it. It has become more than just the name of the house that was in the Greek mythology. Yes, and that goes back to 458 BC. <laughs> yes. When it was, when it won first prize at the Greater Dionysus Festival. <laughs> oh, you've been thinking about that a lot, haven't yes. you? It For other the, things. <laughs> the only surviving evidence of a Greek tragedy, because we always knew that the Greek tragedies come in trilogies, but the Oresteia is the only when the trilogy three. that we yeah. know for a fact because of this festival. Yes. Anyway. Um, there you go. I love it. Um, 
So that's the point of it, which is to show Emery taking on this protective self and owning her symbolic version of comforting herself, mm-hmm. giving the the little girl, Eva, a child, like a doll that has, she had once given back to Omega. Mm-hmm. She is saving her inner child who had once been suffering and alone. Yeah. And also an apology. Yeah. For what? has done um there's definitely a descent this is an underworld Mm -hmm. um purgatory for these three kids i just wanted to comment on the fact that the kids legs dangle wherever they sit they don't touch the floor and the kids when they sit at their bunks their their feet don't touch the floor and the bunk is much longer than it is because (laughs) they have been placed in a what is what would have been a detention center Mm -hmm. or basically a, a testing center for adults This was designed and made for adults to sit. The toys don't seem very fun. No. The toys seem like tests, if anything. Yeah. And there is one clue in this detention center, which is also weird because Hemlock refers to like, there are others in the detention center that you've been to before, Mm. but I'm giving you access to the vault. That's what this place is called. The the vault. vault. Yeah. Interestingly enough. There are the three colors of characters, the green, the red, yeah. and the blue. You co- pointed that out when we were and watching. I pointed yeah. it out that the color missing is yellow. But if you're watching the scene, there's coins on one of the tables, and there's four colors of coins. There's a yellow coin as well. So there's another kid? Well, I would... Maybe? You, we have to presume that Omega or M- Omega is the fourth. She's the yellow one. Uh, that's going to be added to this group. And they all have to protect the white baby of the baby cat. The baby... Yeah. Our baby. So we've got a Pantoran and Iktochi and a Mirialon. There you go. I'm never going to be able to pronounce those no, names. No, <laughs> and I literally had to reread them three times in order to make sure I said them correctly because it's not my thing either. But I looked them up as you do. Oh, and the kids who play Jax and Eva have not done really anything ever before. This is their first Star Wars role. This is their first role for the girl who played Eva. Never done anything before. The other boy's name is Even, and he has done a couple of voice things and one acting thing. They're both young kids. Aww. Did you want to go into uh, behind the scenes? Sure. Let's do that on this episode. So this episode was directed by Saul Ruiz. He hasn't done any in a while. Yep. But this one was written by Amanda Rose Munoz, who's already written one this season. And actually, she wrote both of these episodes. Oh, interesting. Which I just want to say kudos. Because yeah. very different episodes. Yeah. With very different structure to them. One of them is basically a character story and kind of segued through a bunch of different you know, little little motifs and little little story plot points with different mm-hmm. stories throughout. And then the next one is basically point A to point B, you know, an attack. How does everyone respond to that mm-hmm. resolution story? So great work from Amanda Rose Munoz. And I, I can't wait to see what she does when Bad Batch is done, where she moves on to. And hopefully mm-hmm. she'll get something along the role of like uh, Matt McDevitt's role as a story editor and see the bigger picture. Because she definitely does. I see that she sees the bigger picture and is able to structure stories accordingly. Yeah. But that's not the person I wanted to talk about. Okay. I would like to talk to you about a particular role called the Digimat Artist. Ooh. Any idea what a Digimat artist is? And it's M-A-T-T-E. That might help you. A Digimat artist. M-A-T-E. T-T-E. Like T-T-E? a mat. Oh, uh, literally don't know. No? Well, the Digimat artist for The Bad Batch is Kira Anastasia Kabler. Mm-hmm. And she comes from, um, I don't want to get this wrong. She comes from Hampshire College. And in 2019, she graduated with a BA Honors with a thesis in animation. Kira's degree focused on developing a pipeline to create stylized painterly animation while leveraging the benefits of CG. Oh, interesting. Okay. So what a Digimat artist does is they create believable photorealistic environments and backdrops as a painter. Ah, they're the matte artists, so they do do the background. But then they also 
things. research visual references and develop concept art to create photorealistic or stylized matte paintings and set elements. And mm. then they work on integrating matte paintings into 2D or 3D environments using camera mapping or projecting projection mapping techniques. And she's really cool. I have told you already, I'd like to give you a link that you can put in the show notes Mm -hmm. that'll literally send you to what she does. She creates these beautiful 2D backdrops and then adds a 3D element, a 3D moving element on top of the matte painting to have them work together with each other in a seamless interaction. And so there's this great image there's two of them that are in there one of this Mm -hmm. kid looking out a window and there's this other one of this train moving across with the smoke billowing behind in like a western sort of thing and like you watch these and i immediately am sucked into the bad batch style Mm. and so she has been very instrumental in the style the big picture the background upon which the foreground is developed and so i'm pretty sure a lot of these great beautiful shots of that yeah yeah but also this new place where the new cat people and the whole scene yeah that beautiful shot at the beginning of it yeah and then we zoom in i'm pretty sure that she's responsible for developing these but then also developing those great background drops that allow for 3d to interact within and in front of that's so cool yeah and she's been with lucasfilm for three years since 2020 well great work on the bad batch right i i love the painterly aspect of it yeah. and i i know I, or i feel that she's had a hand in that uh that design that that uh aesthetic yeah send me that link and i'll add it to the liner notes for people it's done excellent yep So let's move on to episode 11, Past the Point of No Return, which we've already heard your opinion of the title, but I wanted to tell you my like weird theory about what I think this means. The most famous song I could think of that uh, refers to this is literally from the Phantom of the Opera, which is when the Phantom is dressed up as Don Juan and on stage, Christine doesn't know that he is in disguise on the stage taking over for the opera singer and sings to her that they are past the point of no return we've played the game and now it's at an end and this is the final threshold i.e the entrance into the final act finally we're not going back and why i think that's really important is because of a couple of things both what uh our shadow clone potentially is right in disguise somebody that she knows but is in disguise uh as this you know person that's taking her away into Mm -hmm. the final threshold and also it's about what this represents for omega throughout it and um when i was (laughs) On my Discord right after the episodes aired and I hadn't even watched it yet, Josh on my Discord uh, posted really excitedly, but like, you know, kindly in like hidden text to say vasilisa returning home with a skull in her hands Mm. and i was like what is going on and by the end of the episode we have a skull faced uh you know shadow clone returning home with uh vasilisa who has done her trials has grown up and has chosen to go home and accept these things and it's all about maturing um you know becoming an adult becoming more mature becoming a young adult and you know not being able to go past back from that yeah and you sense the sense of in some ways desperation and like the feeling of helplessness from the batch in the face of this change and that often is how family members feel about when a kid is going through puberty and they're becoming an adult and you can't stop it Mm -hmm. right they're Mm -hmm. going to go through what they need to do to become an adult and at the end when we get there something really really important happens to prove how much omega has grown absolutely i also got a real sense of uh anubis taking horus to the underworld Mm -hmm. component here that that like death has come for our hero to guide them on the next phase of their journey 
definitely going back to the underworld like and it's it's about like the yeah, difference Bilbo Baggins, you must go to the mountain <laughs> well the difference between the maiden arc and the hero arc is the maiden is chased into the underworld right and the hero volunteers to go and fight the dragon yeah that's the big difference usually is that they choose to go on the journey there might be some sort of reticence or some sort of threshold there always, should always be reticence yeah threshold guardian or whatever but the active choice to go and fight the dragon because it's no longer about saving the village it's about saving the kingdom yeah and omega's been there mentally for a really long time but the batch has been like no you sit this one out no yeah you do these things and she's like you know what i am capable to solve these problems and by the end it becomes so apparent how capable she is yeah and how ready she is how ready she is yeah yeah so it starts out with uh our shadow clone x2 finding fee I'm aka so tex girlfriend point of no return should have been that uh that didn't get off that gangplank but like <laughs> also why would fee have left their gangplank down uh, duh. i mean she was dealing with a droid situation a snarky droid situation I, yeah I, I get it but at the same point her her level of distrust of even where she was clicked for her yeah. She pulled her knife. But it was too late. The, the, Absolutely you know, too but, late. But I have left my trunk open while unloading <laughs> groceries. I totally get that. Right? So I, I don't blame Fee. But she's a pirate. Fair. Maybe she had nothing good and everything, n- nothing good on her ship. She and carries a vibro sword. I mean, I... <laughs> Look. I, I I was just a little disappointed <laughs> that she just willy nilly left her gangplank down. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I I'm not gonna say anything more than that. But it wasn't easy for the shadow clone to find the information. Yeah, Texpiracy. Yeah, let's get to Texpiracy at the end here. I got a whole <laughs> bunch to go over why I think the Texpiracy is strong in this episode. Um, mm-hmm. I want to talk more about the Marauder and the loading everything up and right. it all isn't going to fit. We're like, we still haven't gone and gotten the rations yet. You have to put all our eggs in this basket. Yeah. This is important. And in fact, the only two things that don't get loaded to the Marauder are related to Texpiracy later on, but the Tex goggles and Lula. Those are the yeah. only things that don't make it into the ship. Yeah. So what's on the ship that is blown up? Who Omega's knows? brand new bowcaster. I guess Which so. is like, so why was that a moment now? Um, there's all these things that they are now, it's now destroyed. And mm-hmm. they show us in graphic detail the destruction. I really wanted to put it in death count because like <laughs> it was their home. I know. I know. Uh I, I have a lot of theories about this because like it's obvious that this is a metaphor for leaving, leaving the safety of the village. And they all know that Omega is ready to grow up. They all know that they'll sense it. But like Hunter's like, no, 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 I'm not ready. I can't. I can't do this. <laughs> and like it's yep. there's a lot of like these parental metaphors happening throughout and symbol like like symbolism that recognizes you and I like our kids are growing and we're seeing them grow every day and we're feeling that feeling of like at some point they're going to be on their own they're going to be their own adults they're going to be you know fully capable without us and we're kind of not ready either (laughs) but it's going to happen whether or not we want it to happen or not yes Um, but there are a lot of great motifs where like the ship that you rely on that takes you to the places mm-hmm. your home is destroyed and yes and having to recover from that setback and the inability to progress the inability to proceed is now made material in front of you um, yeah and the pirates of the caribbean do it really really well <laughs> and it's so i'm interested in seeing what is the next ship what is yeah. What is the next stage for this? Because they have to go after her. Mm-hmm. They have to find her. She. They will be a part of this concluding arc. They have to be. They have to be, yeah. Um, but it's also a bit of like, you think you know how this story is going to go. But they've been, but 
no, 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 no. Like, right? like yeah. you're going to go and save stuff, but it's not going to go the way you think it is because it's not maybe about what people genuinely think the story is about. It's about something different and it's about... um it's like this show is so deeply psychological. It it bothers me when people like can't see it and I can see it. I'm like, oh, hey, it's all about collecting these different aspects of yourself and like healing yourself and going in the underworld and coming back out and all yeah, of these things. It is that for some people. Yeah. But it is definitely not that for certain others. And Wrecker and Hunter they They're, don't have that. They don't have that this season at all. They don't have no. any sort of... Well, Hunter had more in the second season. It it just feels like there's like... Yeah, they, they need to give those two something. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to be. Yeah, um, maybe this is what it was taking is like... Li- literally, they both die and are, end up in the water. Like maybe... <laughs> I don't <laughs> like, know. Die and come back. Like They didn't die this no, episode. But, but like they get exploded. They get... Yeah you know, taken out. But here's the question. They didn't die this episode. Mm -hmm. And so if they do die, whatever sacrifice they make has to be commensurate with the value of their time in the show. Yeah. And that's relevant. And I'm interested as well, because uh, here's the thing that directors always have trouble with. They always talk about it. It's like, and and writers too, Mm -hmm. is that you try not to give your hero a child or a pet because the moment you do that yeah. you burden them with the security and safety and protection of those things yeah because as so many shows and media have shown us the burden of those things influences the plot like, yeah y- there's so many things that you can't do because now you have those and there's a brilliant moment of that in this episode with batcher who just suddenly dashes off he dashes off because it's like ah, it's hard <laughs> because there was n- there was nothing else they could do they needed to separate badger from omega because badger can't get on the ship with the, omega. the shadow clone mm-hmm. that that can't happen so where would badger be is badger can't just be sitting by the side of record that doesn't seem to be fitting oh crap now we've got badger sitting next to us okay let's hook badger up with hunter since we've thrown him in the water too And I'm starting to see, oh, are Hunter and Wrecker the children, the pets that they've had to like constantly maneuver in this story this this season? This season, yeah. Because they are difficulties in connecting to our protagonist central figure, which has been Omega the whole time. Yeah. And so that's where I'm at. And how, and in, in some ways they've ended up being flat arcs which is not bad like hunter's taken on this parental figure but it's not it's not bad to be a flat arc but it certainly means that you don't have growth and change yeah but i can't say that hunter's taken on a parental figure because hunter tri- that was hunter's whole arc in the first two seasons right hunter tried to be the dad or yeah. resisted being the dad to Omega, then recognized, okay, I need to be a supporting mentor figure to Omega. But then when they recognize that Omega is at the same level and the same understanding and the same sort of kinship as yeah. Hunter, where does he go now? He's not really dead. He's stuck. Yeah. yeah he hasn't, he's, he's been kind of like stuck in his own, like, I, I need to protect Omega so much. And so much of my identity has been turned around this and really like that's when you need to progress to becoming a leader of others absolutely you know that's what needs to happen and he hasn't figured that out yet and maybe this is what happens is like what omega has been saying the whole time is like you have to go and rescue all the clones yeah and he'll finally like take that on and start to plan with rex and echo i'm gonna hope that's the story for i hope so too because that would be the best because they haven't had the time in their limited amount of time in these small episodes, Mm -hmm. they haven't had time to focus on Hunter or they haven't taken that time to focus on Hunter, except to say like he's one minded and driven. And I've harped on this in the past that he's he's only got one way forward when he used to be the guy that noticed everything. Yeah. And he started noticing stuff as soon as she was taken again. (laughs) It was interesting. Um, I, what about the scene where, so Omega's saying goodbye. She's bringing the Lula doll, which you mentioned and text goggles, which is 
so poignant. It's like I'm putting away my childhood and I'm putting away and saving a place in my heart for Tack, who has meant so much to me. Yeah. And these things are safe yeah. here in this, you know, paradise, right? Paradises like this are a place of respite and um, a place you could always go back to, but you can never actually stay very long. No. <laughs> like that's part of it. We, I've been talking about this since last season. I'm like, Pabu is not going to be the place that they end up staying because it's just a place where you go and rest for a bit. It can't, you can't stay there, unfortunately. It's Tahiti. Yeah. <laughs> Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. reference. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, everyone is distracted. We see the Marauder or we see we see the, you know, X2 ship like go in and it goes into the the cave. Mm -hmm. I was reading uh, Dark Side of the Forest or the on the Dark Side. Uh, and the guy was the person who was writing the recap um, said, maybe we should just plug up that cave. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like. Yeah, just as like a recap to be like, did I miss anything? Well, now we know why Ventress left. Well, I, so that the parking space would be empty so for this episode. Exactly, right? Um, <laughs> but you can't plug up a symbolic archetype of transformation like a cave like that. That's really, really important. All of Omega's Jungian shadows come out of that cave. Right. So, and, sh you know, that is the symbol of the transformation we're about to go through i.e. rebirth we're we're getting like the road signs like uh omega your rebirth is coming up in uh yeah in 15 kilometers yeah well i, I do <laughs> want to point out that i think it was just used for economy of scale and economy of I assets mean, because yeah. she isn't taken there no the ship leaves I and know. comes to him so it's I, still I okay but also if it's tech <laughs> it has different meaning yeah well, he's got the parking, uh, you know, the the tag <laughs> to go in the front windshield that allows him to park there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's space in her psyche, which we see by her putting the, the the goggles on the shelf of honor, the treasure honor. Absolutely. Um. So he heads down and he spots Hunter. Hunter's like, whoa, the birds are acting weird. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to get out of here. He's being extra sensey. But it's too late because he has spotted Omega. Mm hmm. Uh, he decides to go after the Marauder to prevent their escape because that's where they're heading. He knows them so well. Yep. And he blows up the Marauder before Wrecker can make it back in there. And the explosion is so well done from mm -hmm. a directorial standpoint. Um, that initial blast is shown and then a cutaway further back as we watch Wrecker get thrown and then another cutaway to the distant sound. Basically, the explosion itself is heard from three different perspectives in one devastating explosion mm -hmm. that's then cut in with the town shrieking and reacting to it. The whole explosion happens and we basically get to see it from three vantage points immediately. The initial first blast, the secondary blast and the repercussions just a little bit further out of Wrecker flying forward carrying Gonky. He captured Gonky. Yeah. And the only thing that's rescued from the Marauder at all is Gonky. Yeah. Um, and then further I respect back, this. I respect this choice. He yeah. droids are people too. Uh, so just yeah. the audio transition as well is done so perfectly well that we hear the explosion all in one and you see all of these things happening in a much more clear and omnipresent sort of place. It was so beautiful uh, as a devastating moment. Like mm -hmm. this is happening. And then after the explosion, people are running and whatnot. You see Hunter and Crosshair's reaction to this explosion. But then you also see them zoom in and the wreckage, the bones of the ship in flame. It's gone. Yeah. So well done. They, they really wanted to destroy that ship like they destroyed uh, the Mandalorian's in yes. and ship in yeah the razor crest the razor crest like yeah. it was like like to me this is like becoming hey we've seen it twice now the family car the family home has been destroyed this this thing that has protected them yep for so long so you parked on that street and the hoodlums have taken <laughs> all, like all the doors and all yeah. the, the wheels and the hubcaps yeah. and the engine and everything else yeah yeah it's it's interesting because we've never seen the falcon blown up like that no uh, but 
it now has happened twice in a Dave Filoni story. So I have a feeling it's becoming something of something that means something to Star Wars. But we'll have to see it three times for it to actually become a uh, paralleled motif in Star Wars. Three times. Yeah. That's the rule. I don't want to see it. I don't like watching I, people's homes get blown but up. It's, it must, it means some, it meant something to Din Djarin. Like, he, Absolutely. Couldn't, he couldn't go back yeah. to what he thought, right? Like, right? he needed to t- own being the dad of Grogu. Yeah. That was what it meant in that moment. Yeah. And in this, it's about letting Omega be herself and yeah. be a heroine yeah. on her own. And I think it will also mean that the Batch has to take their rightful place as leaders and can't be avoiding and can't run around yeah. as a family on vacation right which you know kind of shows like how overprotective and sort of like passive hunter has been and maybe he's actually been a snow queen in that he's just been trying to protect the group and stop omega really from maturing the way that she needed to be but also themselves. Yeah, themselves not, too. Like he's not, not taking, allowing any and, growth for anyone. And not take on the mantle of these leaders that they mm-hmm. know they can be because of their unique perspectives. Um, in the meantime, X2 has let um, the Scorch guy know that... Skidmark, yep. <laughs> they're there. Uh, called in the reinforcements. And like quite literally when the reinforcements start arriving, like the the... Uh, Death Star or the the Star Destroyer like comes in. I I literally started to like panic. It reminded me how scary. We don't get to see how scary the Empire is quite often. No, but this moment of Pabu that we love being overrun by stormtroopers. Yeah, even just from one Star Destroyer. I was reading somebody say that when that Star Destroyer arrived over Pabu, that the motifs that are being done by the Kiner family yeah. is kylo ren's theme in a different line that it's that same kylo ren theme the, that's played over it so there is a uh known motif and i can talk to frank uh layman about this who is a fabulous uh musical analysis person uh who has been on the podcast before but the da 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 that motif is used it's very similar to kylo ren's theme yeah um but it's used when the mandalorian ship lands it's used when other ships are landing it it's kind of ended up being recycled in ways beyond just being associated with Kylo Ren and when ships come down it, it's like got this descent feel to it and I mean, foreboding the boats go down so foreboding and so it's just it's used a lot in the Mandalorian it's used a lot in other places so I don't know if they're necessarily drawing that musical parallel or not right yeah I mean the notes descend the ships descend yeah <laughs> the notes don't resolve into a satisfactory conclusion because because terror is yeah involved, exactly right? so there's yeah. lots of that uh, but I was just reiterating what somebody else had told me because I know how much you love that sort of I do I do stuff it's uh it's it's a pet project of mine that i'm not very good at but i love learning all about it batcher so the the batch is like collected a wrecker and they're trying to heal him and yep. get him fixed up and uh then it's like they're trying to figure out what to do and batcher runs off over some stormtroopers but just before that um they're they're pa- omega's panicking and she goes just, they run into a corridor hunters there crosshairs there batcher's mm-hmm. there she's there and she says it's my fault right and then i really like uh hunter's shiding of her Mm -hmm. and i feel like this just needs we need more of this in our society where a person takes on responsibility for the actions of others because of their intention and hunter's like now listen up girl yeah like it's not your fault empire's fault stay focused yeah um, but yet again, he's wrong. <laughs> so he's wrong again, right? Just stay focused. Like you need to, you need to fight them. She needs to give herself up to them because she needs to make the choice to have the heroic moment uh, fighting against the true evil, not the secondary tentacles yeah. of it. Yeah, like this isn't. You gotta go. You gotta go. Like the whole point of the hero's journey is to have an integration with the darkness that is out there and having 
sort of essentially one sister in the underworld and one sister descending to the underworld creates a lot of interesting symbolic parallels to mythology, Mm -hmm. but also like it ties to how we have an opportunity to save ourselves within our own psyche. And it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, but I'm sure Emery will be part of this. I suspect tech will represent something from a heroine's journey perspective, potentially um, healing the wounded masculine, which is a big step in the heroine's journey. You heal the mother-daughter split, you heal the wounded masculine, and then you're able to leave the underworld as a more whole person. Absolutely. Um, And if she can get to tech while they're on the black arrowhead. Yeah. That'd be really cool because that'd be a great new Marauder-esque ship for the Bad Batch to have in the future. Yeah. I I loved how much it looked like like a Kylo Ren-esque ship because it's black with the red vents. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Cuz you know how much I love all of Kylo Ren's ships. <laughs> oh yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um so essentially uh Omega and Crosshair are left alone because Wreckers down and out, Hunter's chasing the gunship cuz that's the plan is Hunter's going to go after the gunship and ends up being in the water. What a cool segue to get him to the gunship. Hey? It was so cool. Just like surfing the floating container, using the container as a, a shield and then floating on it to use it to leap into the gunship itself. And then the whole sequence that led to that. And X2 there. is like, not on my watch. Right. <laughs> like, Holy like, crap. There's so many, like we'll get to text Pharisee at the end, but there's so many yeah. moments. I'm like, the only way he would know what to do would be if he was tech. Cause yeah. like he knows Hunter's on that ship. Oh, Hunter's going to take out that guy. I got to shoot the guy like it's it's just like there's so many things about it that the only kind of thing i don't think i know is does he not have memories and he just has instincts that's kind of like like if that's the case they have four episodes to reveal that for us (laughs) and and they have to they have to at this point they really have to show us how this how tech became this character yes it deserves its own episode yeah um so cx2 is there with the stormtroopers and Omega realizes that there's no way out. Right. And Crosshair's like trusting her now, right? Like after all of this, like he's like, I'm going to take care of you. And she's like, no, I'll take care of you. (laughs) Like there's been, this journey has been really satisfying to see them get to this point where she comes up with this idea and he's like, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very uh, Luke from Return of the Jedi. Yeah, yeah. All right, kid. <laughs> Especially with the hands in front. Go ahead, put the cuffs on me, right? Yeah. Take me away. Mm-hmm. I fully submit so I can go and confront the genuine evil. This is this is a this is another motif that we do see though because we've yep. also seen it with Ray. Yeah. Ray shipping herself to the finalizer yeah. to go and to Kylo Ren re- whether the promise of Kylo Ren being protective of her was there or not she still was willing to go because she knows that she needed to go and fight Snoke she yep. needed to go and confront the dragon in his own lair and yep. that's what this is about this is so classic hero's journey it's, and Conan in Conan the Barbarian as well yeah exactly right? like I we go see and it submit myself to Snake Mountain Siegfried yep. going and fighting the dragon. Yep. Right. It's not, it's so classic. Yeah. And, but we see it in Star Wars because it's that phase. You're a hero finally. You're willing to go to the dark lair and fight the dragon yourself. Absolutely. Um, so they come up with this plan. She goes and volunteers herself she takes off her hat her childish hat mm-hmm. her you know she's she's or she still has it but she does it at the end well it's or also the way she takes the hat off right at the end right she's there before she meditates it's also been her way of hiding yeah. her way of not of concealing who right. she is and so when she takes the hat off she's, she's saying, revealed i am yeah. revealed for the hero i am i have come into my i am come into my own exactly and because of what happens with the stormtroopers attacking Crosshair. He's not able to put the tracker on her. And this is really important because it has to be her journey. Right. They're still going to find her. Like, that's really important. Yeah. But yes, another journey to the underworld. Um, 
And oftentimes when you journey the underworld and you've transitioned from maiden to hero, the predator is no longer a predator. Mm -hmm. The predator becomes your ally. Mm -hmm. Has to. Like it, Kylo Ren, yeah. right? Like so, it, like, like Darth Vader. The, like Darth Vader, right? So, so this is where I'm like, yes, tech, <laughs> conspiracy, right? But X2 taking her to the underworld as the predator, yeah. Darth Vader, Vader like Kylo Ren, like yeah. has to be this setup because archetypically that is what is happening yep. for our main character. Yep. Sorry. It is interesting to note. <laughs> I'm just like really excited. The, the the segue here is father and son, lovers, and now brother. Yeah. And, and sister. Yeah. Like those these are three different types of relationships yeah. in similar motifs. And how will that play out with that different relationship? Yeah. In there. And yeah. that's really cool. Very interesting. Um so, conspiracy. <laughs> yes. Um, There's so many moments I'm like, oh my God, it's so tech. Yes. Uh, it's a Shep. I want to start with. Um, and Shep's like, how dare you? All the bad, my people are yeah. dragged out of the, the mayor houses. Shep, yeah. And he's like, I've barely done anything yet, but I can do worse. <clears throat> yeah. And I felt like that's, there's so much intelligence Yes. At play. And that is the first step of Techspiracy is how smart is this person breaking into fee's ship when it not was, even just the ship but the computer the hidden the encrypted computer yes. it was super encrypted and i read and watched a video of the person who broke down all the arabesh and told us what all those things meant and it's mm -hmm. like in encrypted de-encrypting decoding all these things and it's happening in a flash because it's tech and he's good at that and that's one of the ways in which he interacts with the world is from a very technical logical mm -hmm. standpoint and also he he like weighs the the choices mm -hmm. of and this like sort of the stats of you know like he he's given statistical a, analysis he's done this he's he's literally like the c3po we've talked about mm -hmm. this like he's the c3po of don't of tell me the, the odds I hate, I hate that exactly. Yeah, exactly like he's got the odds and mm -hmm. so he makes the the choice of what is the best option based on the odds all the time yeah but moreover he could have just killed fee Yes. And taking the information. He did not kill her. He could have gone onto the ship, hid there. She mm -hmm. went in, kills her, takes the information. Right. Why doesn't he do that? He didn't seem to have problems with killing people in the first episode that right? we saw him. So it definitely feels like there's like a bit of like, we, we, we've we been theorizing what's happened to him. And I don't think he has his memories because like why he knew where Pabu is. Yep. Right. So I don't think he has his memories, but I think he has like his feelings a little bit. Maybe I don't know. like it's maybe like the Winter Soldier where he like, like, what's a Bucky, you know, exactly. Right. Like what's attack. But that will be awoken in him, hopefully somehow. Rail car 17. Yeah, that sort of thing. Like, yeah, I would I would love for that to occur. Um. So it again, following on this, the same vein Conspiracy. there. Um. She tried to cover her tracks, but he broke the encryption and it makes it sound like it was just the easiest thing in the world. So he's really good at that. Then immediately after that, text glasses. Right. Got to be put in the foundation. So text glasses are once again shown to us. He's important, but we're never going to talk about how we feel about him being gone. Yeah. Because if we did that. That would be real. That would. Well, it would also. <laughs> It would also put us, it's a kid's show. So let's look at it from that perspective. It's it's animated and meant for children to I mean, watch as well. Rebels had an entire grieving episode for the loss of Kanan. And, and that's someone who's actually dead. No, I know. That's yeah. why I'm like, Taxpiracy. We we don't <laughs> want to give you false grief. We mm -hmm. want to give you, we want to give you genuine hope. Yes. So let's let's gloss over those components because He's coming back and we never saw him actually pass. Um, at one point, Omega says, the people here are innocent. And Tech responds, then you sh never should have come here in the first place. Which is such a coldly logical statement to make. Yeah. That I cannot help but attribute it to Tech reasoning as well. Yeah. Like then you never should have come here in the first place. If you wanted, you knew I was coming after you, you knew I would get here, yeah. you should have gone somewhere horrible so that you wouldn't feel as bad as you do right now. 
Right. Wow. <laughs> also just a beautiful line. Like, that's just great. That's just great writing right there. Like, several times over, Amanda's, or Amanda Rose Munoz has shown us once again just how skillful she is at giving us hard lines <laughs> yeah. that, that, we, that we can be shocked at the moment and then still further unpack. I, I'm unpacking the Cad Bane one and that one still yes yeah scanner for tracking devices right away like, oh you come yeah. with me scanner for tracking devices they didn't do that with luke nope they didn't do that with ray nope <laughs> nobody made those comments nope it's way too smart for your own good tech we and, see you and then if we recall tech is an incredibly good shot he is a really good shot we saw yeah. that in the first season he's a great shot Not as good as Crosshair. Crosshair was further away, but Tech was a really good shot in the first season. Mm -hmm. And this character is also a very good shot as well. Yeah, because he killed that uh, gunship pilot. Yeah. So given that that's the case, a lot of people have been saying, well, not a lot of people, but one person was saying to me that maybe this Shadow clone isn't Tech. Maybe they're an amalgam of the other Bad Batch into this other individual that isn't Tech. I have dissuaded them of that by saying tech is his is good in his own way, but that doesn't mean that their fields of expertise don't overlap with each other. Yeah. And trying to pull back together your own psyche after losing it would be you become the favorite right? versions of the people that you love. Yeah. Crosshair is an exceptionally good sniper that comes with a necessary amount of perception. Hunter is really Mm -hmm. well known for his perception because that's what he's good at is he's noticing the details in Mm -hmm. the environment around here. So there's crossover between the two of their skill sets. The same thing with tech and crosshair. There's a there's a a necessary crossover of their skill sets as well due to the heightened intelligence that come with needing Mm -hmm. to track and figure out all of the angles for how to make a shot. Um, one's not as good as the other because their skill sets overlap. Yeah. Not because of the fact that this is an amalgam figure. Um, and don't forget he's wearing his backpack the whole time. The whole time. Hunter's wearing his backpack the whole time too, but he has no other possessions in his worldly life. So no, maybe. He's got his knife and his bandana. And maybe Omega's crossbow. Maybe it's in, in there. In Hunter's backpack. I I hope so, because Echo made such an important gift of that. Right? For it now to be lost? Yeah. The new crossbow. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I mean, she got to use it that one episode. Not even really, right? Shooting animals or something? I I don't even recall. We're moving on. Um, So with that that insight, it is time for Death Count. Oh, no. We've talked about it a little bit. There have not been a lot this season. No. But this episode does bring it into There was full like no perspective. death count last episode because it was about children and yeah. even Cad Bane didn't kill that mob. But oh my God, <laughs> ship's landing count last episode. Like, oh my, I just can't even. Uh, similar with this episode. Uh, it, we just seem to always need to know where the ship's going to land and then the ship's taking off. Where is the I, ship? It's a Star Wars necessity. Nonetheless, <laughs> there were five. Okay. Hunter takes out two. The guys he throws from the gunship because they definitely don't surface from the water. Uh, Both of those were death screams (laughs) for sure. Um, Tech takes out the pilot causing the ship to crash. And Crosshair does not change his sniper rifle to stun and actually kills two stormtroopers in the attempt to fire the tracker onto the ship. Mm -hmm. So literal death occurred as a an in the attempt to get the tracker onto the ship. Wow. So five in total. And it just went into the ocean. Right. And uh, it is the, the, the tracker went past the point of no return. I have a, I have a good, uh, you know, statement to say, and this is um, to kind of end this episode and to show kind of like how fully Omega is stepping into being a hero phase archetype, right? Heroine fully. Mm hmm. When you've decided to take and own your power, you realize that the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Yeah. And Omega is just like, come to this full look. I'm the one. They want me. I'm not what they think I am. I'm going to go. And how cool to draw it back a few episodes earlier 
to show the meditation taught by Gungi that she is now passing on. Taking off her hat as we talked about. That it's actually, it was never about that. It was entirely about her centering herself for what she has to do. Yeah. I think it'll be a really cool like final arc of these episodes. And uh, we're past the point of no return. The final threshold. I'm excited. Yes. 80-ish minutes to go. 90 minutes to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for all of the insight into the Digimat artist. How cool is that? So cool. And uh, we will be back ooh, maybe next week if it's like super exciting and we have lots to talk about. Either way, we will be back. Yes. <laughs> to finish out this season of Bad Batch and uh, to see how it resolves, which is, I think, the most important thing to me is like how does this resolve and then talking about what it means sounds great thank you cheers thank you for listening to what the force i'm marie claire gould your host our music is orchestral music by christy carew for what the force you can support the show directly on patreon at patreon.com slash what the force we'd like to thank all our patrons especially those who love and are obsessed with what the force john in wild space how rude anna perez neil christian luca carly ann scott c and susan support the show by wearing the force with our merch like and subscribe on youtube or leave a five-star review on itunes or other pod apps it helps others find the show connect with us on twitter at wt4 show what the force podcast on facebook our website is whattheforce.ca or the discord link is in the liner notes feel free to reach out and start a conversation cheers cheers